Christian, you believe in the power of prayer. According to a recent poll, three out of four doctors believe that God is performing medical miracles on earth right now. Most Christians believe that God is curing cancers, healing diseases, reversing the effects of poison, and so on. So here's question one. Why won't God heal amputees? It's a simple question, isn't it? We all know that amputated legs do not spontaneously regenerate in response to prayer. Amputees get no miracles from God. If you're an intelligent person, you have to admit that this is an interesting question. On the one hand, you believe that God answers prayers and performs miracles. On the other hand, you know that God completely ignores amputees when they pray for miracles. This type of argument is designed to misdirect and mislead. The assumption being, if God doesn't heal an amputee, then God doesn't heal at all. To begin with, just because neither you nor I nor the vast majority of people watching this video has ever witnessed an amputee healed miraculously by God, does not mean it never has happened at any time in the whole history of humanity. To assume this is based on an argument for ignorance. We assume this is the case because we do not know anyone to whom it has ever happened, but that doesn't mean that it has never happened. Secondly, the scriptures state, God is the one who gives understanding and knowledge to men. God also provides the natural resources man needs to help himself through acquiring understanding and knowledge about those resources. God designed and created nature, left it up to us to a very large extent to discover her secrets and learn how to use them. Like it or not, God is responsible for all healing. While man likes to take the credit, both the knowledge and healing itself was given to man by the Creator. The doctor dresses the wound, but nature does the healing, and God is responsible for nature and the mechanisms of healing operating through it. If God provided the means through nature to heal sickness and injuries, including an amputated body part, then God made the healing of amputees possible, and if they are not healed, it is not because God failed to provide a means to do so, but rather it is due to man's lack of understanding and knowledge regarding God's provisions. Remember, God gives man understanding and knowledge. So as man learns more about the provisions God has already provided, even amputees will be able to eventually grow new limbs. When we reach this understanding, remember, God gave us the ability to acquire the knowledge, and God also is the one responsible for the healing that occurs through the application of the knowledge man discovered. The ability has always been there, even before man's discovery of it. So in a very real sense, God does heal amputees. And I put my finger and I said, you need to get rid of that airplane. And that's when I cut my finger off. It just sliced it straight off. Took it off. We don't know where the piece went. Uh, we never did find it. How much of the finger? It took off probably about that much of the finger. The photos of his severed finger are pretty graphic. You can understand why doctors said he'd lost it for good. But it grew back with the help of a mystery powder. Nerves, tissue, blood vessels, skin in just four weeks. Miracle man sprinkles miracle powder on his finger. They even pens. call it pixie dust. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, they call it pixie dust. They yeah. sprinkle and it grew back. Right. But, I mean, was it at all like that? That's exactly what I did. This is where the pixie dust comes from, though at the University of Pittsburgh, they call it extracellular matrix. They scrape the cells from pig's bladders, dry out the tissue, and form either sheets or powder. Normally, when we're wounded, we scar, but the scientists say putting the extracellular matrix on the wound stimulates the cells to regrow instead. They hope the technique might one day work on organs and possibly more. 
As a Christian, you believe that God cares about you and answers your prayers. So the second question is, why are there so many starving people in our world? Look out at our world and notice that millions of children are dying of starvation. It really is horrific. Why would God be worried about you getting a raise while at the same time ignoring the prayers of these desperate, innocent little children? It doesn't make sense, does it? Why would a loving God do this? To explain it, you have to come up with some kind of very strange excuse for God. Like, God wants these children to suffer and die for some divine, mysterious reason. Then you push it out of your mind because it absolutely does not fit with your view of a loving, caring God. What you have to realize is according to the Bible, the human race is separated from God by sin. And because of that sin, the whole creation is in a fallen state. In other words, it has been corrupted and now is experiencing death and decay. Sin is the cause of this. The Bible declares the wages of sin is death and all have sinned. It is sin that brings death and that is why we grow old and die with age. Sin at its very heart is selfishness, self-centeredness, and this is why children starve because of selfishness which is the sin nature showing through. It is estimated there is enough wheat grown each year in the state of Washington alone to give a loaf of bread to every man, woman, and child on this planet at least once a week. We produce 17% more food now than we did 30 years ago, and yet a billion people go to bed hungry every single night. There is plenty of food on earth to feed every person. The problem isn't lack of food. The problem is in its distribution. And just for a side note, you might find it interesting to know the most charitable organizations in the world are Christian organizations. They feed, shelter, and clothe more people around the world than all other religious and non-religious organizations put together. This is not just a fancy claim. This is a provable statistical fact that you can easily research and discover. Christians are out there trying to make a difference and help end the suffering. When was the last time you heard of a Muslim or a Hindu or even a Buddhist organization doing missions work and feeding, sheltering, clothing, and educating those who are impoverished? For that matter, how about all of the atheist organizations? How do they fare for helping humanity? Third question, why does God demand the death of so many innocent people in the Bible? Look up these verses. Exodus 35, 2, God demands that we kill everyone who works on the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy chapter 21, God demands that we kill disobedient teenagers. Leviticus 20, God demands the death of homosexuals. Deuteronomy chapter 22, God demands that we kill girls who are not virgins when they marry. And so on. There are lots of verses like these. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would a loving God want us to murder our fellow human beings over such trivial matters? Just because you work on the wrong day of the week, you must die? That makes no sense, does it? In fact, if you think about it, you realize that it's insane. So you create some kind of rationalization to explain these. To begin with, as has already been said, man is in a sinful fallen state and sin is the violations of God's laws. The mistake made here is assuming people are innocent. There is none righteous, no not one, according to scripture. If you think you are basically a good person at heart, let me ask you a few questions just to see if that is in fact the case. Have you ever lied? If you have, what does that make you? Well, it makes you a liar, doesn't it? How about theft? Have you ever stolen anything in your entire life? The cause of the item doesn't matter because theft is theft. If you have, what does that make you? Well, it makes you a thief, doesn't it? Have you ever committed adultery? No? Let me remind you that Jesus said, if you even look upon another person with lust, you are guilty of committing adultery with them in your heart. So have you ever looked at another person with lust? If you have, 
and you know you have, you are an adulterer in the eyes of God. How about murder? No. Never committed murder? Well, again, scripture states, if you even hate another person, you are guilty of murder before your creator, because God is not just concerned with your actions. He plans on judging the thoughts and the intents of your heart. And scripture declares we have all sinned. Scripture declares that if you've broken even one of God's commandments at any point, at any time, you are guilty of breaking the whole of his law. So if God does exist and he judges you by this standard, would you be guilty or innocent? If you were truthful, you know you would be guilty. If you were honest, you would have to admit, at least to yourself, that you are a lying, thieving, adulterous murderer at heart, and you have to give an account before a holy, perfect, righteous God on the day of judgment. God declares all thieves, all adulterers, all sexually immoral, all liars, all blasphemers will have their place in the lake of fire. So again, if God judged you by his standard, are you really a good person, or are you guilty? And if you are guilty, would you go to heaven, or God's lake of fire, to be completely destroyed as a lawbreaker? You might say, God is love, so he wouldn't send me to that place. And you know, when you say this, you are guilty of violating God's second commandment. Do not make for yourselves any idols or graven images. You can break this commandment with your hands or with your mind. So when you say, God is love and will not punish me for my crimes against him, you have created a God in your mind you are more comfortable with. In addition, man must realize while God is love and God does love you, he loves a lot of other things as well, including holiness, righteousness, and absolute justice. In fact, God loves these things so much that he has vowed that anyone found guilty when they come before him to give an account, he will execute against them absolute, certain, and perfect justice. You will not be able to hide anything from his sight, for his eyes will look right into the depths of your heart and see even the secret things that you thought nobody else saw and nobody else knew. Nothing will be hidden from his righteous eyes. You will be weighed. You will be measured. And if you're found wanting, God promises your end will be the lake of fire. So are people really innocent? Not according to God. We are all desperately wicked and vile in his sight. Even our most noble and moral deeds are evil in the sight of God. So if this is in fact the case, scripturally speaking anyway, then who can possibly be saved? And how can they be saved? This is where Jesus comes in. But I will explain who he is and what he did on your behalf later in this video. For now, in addressing the question that has been proposed, God ordered death not upon the innocent, but upon the guilty from his standpoint, not man's moral standpoint. Question 4. Why does the Bible contain so much anti-scientific nonsense? You have a college degree, so you know what I'm talking about. You know how science works. You happily use the products of science every day. Your car, your cell phone, your microwave oven, your TV, your computer. These are all products of the scientific process you know that science is incredibly important to our economy and to our lives. But there's a problem. As an educated person, you know that the Bible contains all sorts of information that's total nonsense from a scientific perspective. The maker of this video that I am responding to likes to constantly refer back to you being an educated person person with a college degree and loves to remind us all how smart we are. The implication being that if you do not see it his way, you must be an uneducated, ignorant fool. In reality, the scriptures declare the fool are those who say there is no God. 
God did not create the world in six days, 6,000 years ago, like the Bible says. The maker of this video I am responding to here makes the claim the earth has been proven not to be young as the Bible says, and therefore to believe it is to make a person unscientific. Obviously, he holds to the unproven claim the world is 4.5 billion years old and was not created in a literal six-day period. This is based purely on assumption and speculation, but not on scientifically demonstrable facts. It is based on the radiometric dating methods that are all equally flawed. Radiometric dating is based on the idea that certain isotopes break down over time at a certain rate into daughter compounds, and by measuring the amount of parent compounds to their daughter compounds, you can determine the age of a thing accurately, such as estimating the amount of the parent compound of uranium to its decayed daughter compound lead, or the parent compound of carbon-14 to its daughter compound, carbon-12. The problem is, in order to get the the method to work requires making unknowable assumptions, such as how much uranium isotopes were in a rock versus naturally occurring lead isotopes to begin with, or how much potassium versus argon, or carbon-14 versus carbon-12. To give you an illustration, in a simple way, suppose you entered a room where you saw a candle burning, and I asked you, how long the candle has been burning. You obviously could not tell me since it was burning when you got there. So you measure the length of the candle and find out the candle is five inches tall. Okay, when was it lit? You still can't tell me. So we do some more scientific measurements to determine how fast it burns. So we watch it very carefully to see how much the candle burns in one hour and remeasure. And we discover that the candle burns approximately one inch an hour. We now have two hard scientific facts. The candle is five inches long and it is burning one inch an hour. So, when was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make two assumptions. How tall was it, and has it always burned at the same rate? Two things about the candle you cannot possibly know with any degree of accuracy or certainty. Without knowing how long the candle actually was when it started burning, nor whether or not it had been burning at a constant rate since the time that it was lit, you could not possibly tell me how long the candle had been burning. This illustration sh should be adequate to show why no one can say that the Earth is actually not young, and this should also demonstrate very clearly why radiocarbon dating of any form simply does not actually prove that the Earth is ancient. In addition, we have Dr. Gentry's discovery of polonium-218 halos in isolation in granite rock. It is well known polonium-218 can be produced in the decay process of uranium. However, when we discover polonium halos encapsulated in granite rock without the uranium halos, we find a bit of a mystery. How did the polonium halos get into the rock without whatever produced it? This finding is very significant because polonium-218 has a half-life of about three minutes. This means if you had an ounce of polonium-218 in three minutes, you would have a half ounce, and in another three minutes, one-fourth ounce, and so on. So somehow, these polonium-218 halos became encapsulated in the rock, and the rock would have had to been cool, because if it were molten, the heat would have messed up the halos and you wouldn't find halos. So what this bit of evidence demonstrates very powerfully is that the polonium got encapsulated in the granite rock, the rock was cool, and in one hour, at the very most, the earth was solid. Unlike the evolutionary claim, the earth was molten and gradually cooled over millennia of time. This discovery also shows in the earth's past, the processes of decay were not constant 
as it is today, but something else was definitely taking place that was significantly different. Thus, the polonium discovery demonstrates a high likelihood decay rates of all radioactive materials were not as stable in the past as in our present time. Therefore, radioactive decay rates as a means to date the age of the Earth are invalidated. They just don't work. The polonium showing granite and therefore the Earth coming into existence in a cooled state in less than an hour versus evolution's billions of years is not a small gap. But this is what the observable, provable evidence overwhelmingly demonstrates. There was never a worldwide flood that covered Mount Everest like the Bible says. And yet, the evidence for a catastrophic worldwide flood is overwhelming. We have thousands upon thousands of limestone sedimentary layers laid down all over the earth. From the Grand Canyon to limestone formations contiguous with Montana and Europe, Australia, Africa, and every other point on the globe. It should be noted limestone sediments can only be produced underwater. We have polystratic fossils of trees growing straight through several supposed geologic strata layers, which are claimed to represent geological times or ages. Are we to believe these trees stood for hundreds of thousands of years? while each successive geological age of strata accumulated around them? Or is it more logical to suggest these trees were buried suddenly in a global flood in tons upon tons of sediments where they were buried and then fossilized? Normally, dead animals do not fossilize. They are eaten by bugs and scavengers, decay from the elements long before they can ever become a fossil. You need three main ingredients to manifest a fossil. Sudden burial, pressure, and heat. All three of which would have been present during a global flood. We have pockets of huge graveyards found all over the earth with many different kinds of animals, as if they were swept away by floodwaters and deposited together and fossilized. And speaking of Mount Everest, the peak of that mountain is composed of limestone layers, and embedded in those layers are thousands of fossilized marine animals, strongly demonstrating that its mountain tops were once completely covered by water. These are just a few of the evidences for a worldwide catastrophic flood. And for someone to say that the world did not have a global flood, and that Mount Everest was never covered by water, obviously is either completely ignorant or lying. Jonah did not live inside a fish's stomach for three days like the Bible says. While I cannot demonstrate with hard evidence at this time the biblical documentation of Jonah in the belly of a fish, much of what you have already said that was not true about the scriptures, I have in turn offered up evidence in refutation of. There is overwhelming archaeological and scientific evidence which has been discovered over the years to at least establish the Bible as a credible and in many cases verifiable document. Since this is a fact, the story of Jonah is likely also valid when one considers the wealth of evidence supporting the Bible in other areas. Over the last 150 years, every time a skeptic has said, this is not true about the Bible, when the evidence was discovered, the Bible was validated 100% of the time without fail, which in my opinion simply serves to validate the authenticity and authority of God's word. And I will leave your claim about the story of Jonah on that note. God did not create Adam from a handful of dust like the Bible says. These stories are all nonsense. Why would an all-knowing God write nonsense? It makes no sense, does it? So you create some type of very strange excuse to try to explain why the Bible contains total nonsense. You're absolutely right. The Bible contains total nonsense. And as I have demonstrated here already, the Bible contains nonsense with volumes of observable evidence in its support. Whole volumes exist in support of the Bible and the Christian faith. So why do large numbers of people refuse to accept it? 
Is it because the evidence in favor of it is poor or lacking? No, not at all. But rather it is because, as God said in the scriptures, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God turned them over to their own reprobate minds. Romans 1, 28. Which is more believable? Man, and for that matter, all of physical existence was spontaneously created out of nothing, as nothing exploded into nothing, and then, over eons of time, gradually congealed into something, or that the physical universe, including man, is the product of an all-powerful intelligent being? I think the answer is obvious, and easily answerable even by nitwits with the slightest of common sense. Why is God such a huge proponent of slavery in the Bible? And why do all intelligent people abhor slavery and make it completely illegal? You have to come up with some kind of weird rationalization to explain it. To begin with, God is not a huge proponent of slavery. Rather, he permits it. When man rebelled against his creator, an issue was raised. Can man successfully live independently of his creator's guidance and govern himself? God already knows the answer to this question, but he allows or permits slavery and all other evils so that in the end man will hopefully realize he cannot live apart from his creator successfully. If at the end his spirit still insists he wants nothing to do with God, then his creator will give that soul his ultimate wish, which requires total destruction in the lake of fire, because apart from our source we cannot exist. In addition, Jesus stated that he had come to set the captives free. So this shows, in addition, God does not see slave and master, but rather he sees both are in the same boat. Both are slaves to sin, and both are equally in chains. You have to draw on the Christian worldview in order to make your arguments on this video. Absolute logic and absolute moral right and wrong can only exist from a Christian worldview. If a person takes the stance there is no God, and life and physical existence spring from some uncontrolled explosion in space, and we are products of a series of numerous accidental sequences of events, starting with the Big Bang and leading up to our present state, then there is neither absolute logic nor morality. We are just a series of chaotic events that just happen to work out for us. The universe is in constant change, and therefore the laws of logic can change as well as morality. If we are nothing but chemical reactions in our brains, then there can be neither right nor wrong, neither one argument more logically sound than another since it's just a bunch of random chemical reactions in our brains. So our brain's reactions in a universe where a god of law and order does not exist would be no more valid than the chemical reactions in a different brain. It would all be meaningless. So when you appeal to logic or to morality, you are presupposing there is such a thing. You are presupposing there is a real law existing, making logic a genuine and reliable thing. When you appeal to morality, you are presupposing there is, in fact, a real moral law that pervades the universe and man. These presuppositions are perfectly understandable for a Christian who believes God exists, but it is not consistent with a person who denies God's existence and believes in a universe of accident and chance. People who make arguments against the Bible and God's existence actually presuppose the existence of God, because even to make an argument against God, they must appeal to qualities which are only possible in a universe governed by a God, and therefore they know God exists just as it's recorded in Romans chapter 1.
Question six, why do bad things happen to good people? It makes no sense. You've created an exotic excuse on God's behalf to rationalize it. Why do good things happen to bad people? Both good and bad things happen to all people. Jesus said about God, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5:45. Question 7. Why didn't any of Jesus' miracles in the Bible leave behind any evidence? It's very strange, isn't it? Like all other activities, miracles tend to occur in isolated events. So the only means that we have to determine a miracle occurred is through the same means we determine the veracity of other events. And that is through eyewitness accounts and historically written records. Often, by eyewitnesses, of the events. Almost all events we know of in history are due to these two sources. Tacitus and Josephus, two uh, prominent historians of the general period of Jesus, recorded Jesus was a miracle worker. Josephus stated he was a man, if we dare call him a man, who did wondrous works. Even the enemies of Jesus the Pharisaic Jews recorded in their own Talmud that Jesus subverted the people and was guilty in their eyes of heresy and put to death for sorcery. This claim by even Jesus' enemies that he did sorcery is actually a claim that he performed supernatural feats such as miracles. It might be argued that historical events can sometimes be confirmed through archaeological evidence. Interestingly, there is a miracle from Jesus where the preponderance of evidence supports that a miracle actually did take place. That evidence is known today as the Shroud of Turin. Now I realize there are many scoffers who like to claim the burial wrappings of Christ with his image on the cloth is a medieval fraud. The fact of the matter is that there are mountains of evidence obtained from the shroud testify to its authenticity. The fact the image is only on the first two microfibers of the cloth surface completely disprove any sort of painting as no pigments nor products from them are on the shroud. Nor was technology available to Middle Ages artists that could have made it possible. The fact the forensic evidence shows the man on the shroud suffered in every detail as described in the Bible regarding Jesus and that the image is consistent and anatomically perfect to the smallest exactitude for what a crucified person would look like medically. Details which could not have been known by medieval anatomists, let alone any artist from the same period. Human blood was found on the cloth of the AB type. Pollen samples from a shroud demonstrate pollens were present that are found only in and around Jerusalem, demonstrating the cloth was not limited to Europe, but was in and around Palestine at some time in its history. Historians have also been able to, very recently, piece together the history and migration of the shroud clear back to the first century when Jesus was crucified. VP8 analysis of the image on the cloth also show the image is encoded with three-dimensional information, a characteristic not seen with two-dimensional images such as photographs and paintings. The only supposed evidence used to dismiss the shroud as not being authentic but a clever forgery was carbon-14 dating of a small piece of the cloth from the shroud. Given what has already been said earlier regarding radiometric dating methods, it is a feeble excuse to dismiss the shroud out of hand on such a basis, especially in light of the overwhelming evidence in other areas of science that bespeak of the cloth being a legitimate article. In addition, another un deniable fact about carbon-14 dating is that the method has failed to accurately date artifacts of known ages. In fact, freshly killed mollusks under carbon dating yielded an age of death at 3,000 years ago, and 
bristlecone pines consistently have dated under this method two to three thousand years younger than their known age. So again, if these methods fail even when the age of a thing is known, determining the age of an object of any kind of an unknown age will not prove any more useful. But this was the only piece of evidence applied to rule out the shroud as authentic. Keep in mind, every other piece of data collected from this relic overwhelmingly speaks authenticity. Given the known failings of all radiometric dating methods and the abundance of other evidences in favor of the shroud being the burial cloth of Christ, logic dictates going where the preponderance of the evidence leads, and it leads unquestionably to a supernatural resurrection event. For greater information and deeper details on the individual evidences of the Shroud of Turin, I suggest watching the videos Proof the Shroud of Turin is the Burial Cloth of Jesus Christ or the Shroud of Turin by the BBC. Now, the Shroud of Turin, if authentic, and all the real evidence strongly suggests that it is, is a piece of archaeological evidence demonstrating a miracle from Jesus. Question number eight. How do we explain the fact that Jesus has never appeared to you? Jesus is all-powerful and timeless, but if you pray for Jesus to appear, nothing happens. You have to create a weird rationalization. While it may be true, Jesus has not appeared to the vast majority of those who watch your videos. The presupposition here is that Jesus has never appeared to anyone, which is a supposition that cannot be proved nor disproved. Many people throughout history have claimed that Christ came to them. The skeptics' way around this is simply to dismiss the testimony of the eyewitness and deem the person delusional. The denunciation of another person's experience that they saw Jesus does not mean they did not see him. Neither you nor anyone else can make that claim. All you can personally attest to is that Jesus never appeared to you personally. That's all. But this does not mean in any way that Jesus never appeared to a person at any time. Question 9. Why would Jesus want you to eat his body and drink his blood? It sounds totally grotesque, doesn't it? Why would an all-powerful God want you to do something that, in any other context, sounds like a disgusting, cannibalistic, satanic ritual? If you remember our discussion earlier in this video about whether you are a good person or not from the standpoint of God's law, you will recount that you are guilty of breaking them. Remember, from God's standpoint, that you are a lying, thieving, adulterous murderer at heart, and you have to give an account before a holy, perfect, righteous God on the day of judgment. God declares all thieves, all adulterers, all sexually immoral, all liars, all blasphemers will have their place in the lake of fire. Nearly 400 years before Jesus appeared, Isaiah prophesied his coming by stating, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was put upon him, and with his wounds we are healed. The Lord Jehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when he shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He was numbered among the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.
Herein is found the love of God for mankind, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Indeed, it was God's love for you that compelled him to become a man. It was God's love for you that two thousand years ago led him up the side of a hill outside the city of Jerusalem and through that love willingly embrace three nails and two wooden beams crossed. A legal transaction occurred that day. We broke God's law and Jesus paid our fine. It's just that simple. Think about it like this. You're standing before the judge. All the evidence is in against you, proving your guilt beyond all doubt. You owe the court a billion dollars and you have no way to pay the debt. It's either pay the debt or be thrown in jail for the rest of your life. The judge's gavel is about to slam down, bringing with it the full weight of your debt. When suddenly, someone you don't even know loves you so much they step up and pay the debt on your behalf, thus completely satisfying the requirements of the court. This is what Jesus did for you, in a manner of speaking, in the court of God. He paid your debt in full, and it is upon that basis God can and will dismiss all charges in your case on the day of his wrath and judgment. But in order to have this dismissal, you must appropriate that payment by changing your mind about who Jesus is, calling out to him for mercy, and trusting in him with your whole heart as your Lord and Savior for the rest of your life. I will not give you a preset prayer, for God does not respond to the reciting of words or incantations. The only thing he will hear is a broken, contrite, and humbled heart crying out with everything in it for mercy. A prayer prayed that way, God will not despise. So if you want mercy, if you want pardon from all crime for all time, then just ask and mean it. If you do, God will accept it and grant to you what you don't deserve, everlasting life. And this is what is meant to eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood. It is a symbolic gesture meaning to receive God's payment for our lawlessness and sin so that we can escape the wrath of God that is coming. This is why Jesus said, Unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you have no life in you. And finally, question number 10. Why do Christians get divorced at the same rate as non-Christians? Christians get married in front of God and their Christian friends, all of whom are praying to God for the marriage to succeed. And then they say, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. God is all-powerful, so if God has put two people together, that should seal the deal, shouldn't it? Yet Christians get divorced at the same rate as everyone else. To explain this, you have to create some kind of convoluted rationalization. Many people get married out of their own volition without ever seeking God's advice or will in the matter. Many people, I would say most in fact, marry not because they actually are in love with the other person, but for other reasons, usually of a very selfish nature, lust or money or they just don't want to be alone or out of convenience but not out of love, not out of true, deep down in the core of your being love. Yet the Bible states, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So in other words, if love does not unite the people involved in the union, then it is not a marriage joined by God. In fact, there are unions without legalized marriage that are probably more of a marriage in the eyes of God than others that have been sanctioned by the state. In addition to this, many people claim to be Christian because they were born into families whose religion is traditionally Christian. But this does not make them a true Christian. In order to become a member of God's family, you must be born again in the heart by the power of God through faith in believing. The false supposition here is everyone who claims to be a Christian really is when in fact, many, if not most, are not truly God's own. The first chapter of the Gospel of John puts it succulently. He came to his own, Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, 
to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not by blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. So in brief, the reason divorce is just as prevalent among Christians as in those who are non-Christians is because a true Christian is born by the will of God, not blood or flesh or the will of man. But most people who are born into a family whose religion is Christian think that makes them a Christian too. But according to the scriptures, this is not how one becomes a Christian or gains access to eternal life. In short then, most Christians are not true Christians, and thus they are no different from others. Additionally, again, as was said earlier, unless love joined them together in a true spiritual union, which rarely actually occurs in this world, God, which is love, never joined them in the first place. What if you instead assume that God's imaginary? A funny thing happens. The answers to every one of these questions make complete sense. Do you see what has happened here? When we assume that God exists, the answers to these ten questions make absolutely no sense. But if we assume that God is imaginary, our world makes complete sense. It's interesting, isn't it? Actually, it's more than interesting. It's incredibly important. Our world only makes sense when you understand that God is imaginary. Our world, with its delicate balance and intricate design, teeming with life, and following solid fixed laws of nature and physics, makes sense only if God exists. There are laws governing this universe, and therefore, it only makes sense if there is a lawgiver. There is incredible intelligence and design easily observable throughout the whole of creation that simply does not make sense unless there is a designer and an intelligence that pervades all things, from the stars and planets right down to the very sub and atomic particles we see design, order and law demonstrating the fingerprint of God. These findings are not something we would expect to witness in a universe arising from accident and chance. It only makes sense if we assume God exists, and that is why we see such order, intelligence, and design everywhere we look. Creation looks designed because it is designed. There is a real and great mind behind things that can easily be discerned to all who have sense, and the Bible is a testament from that mind. The Bible has been looked at, read, studied, and questioned more than any other book in history. And it has been attacked time and time again by each generation in their turn. Like hammers beating down upon an anvil, the hammers in their turn are worn out, but the anvil still endures. If the Bible had not been the Word of God, men would have destroyed it long ago. But the hammers are worn out and the book still lives. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away, and his words still endure to this day. Truly, God exists in spite of repeated attacks. His word still lives, a word that is breathed out by his spirit, testified to by the whole of his creation. In truth, what we witness all around us only makes sense if God exists, because he does, and he has backed up these truths by many infallible proofs, and upon these truths, the defense rests.